Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Rim has reminded me that most of us would rather be taking a nap. Uh, than being there. But uh, I'll, try to, I'll try to keep you awake for the next uh, 25 minutes or so of my talk. And uh, maybe a, a news can put us all to sleep again. I don't know. Um, it's really nice to be here. This is my second uh, Redwood MedNet um, appearance. And I, I, I really value uh, this conference. It's small. Um, it's manageable. Um, the quality of the conversations that occur uh, uh, after the talks and before the talks, I think, are really extraordinary. And I've already had several uh, conversations with you that are, um, are I consider to be quite important. So um, glad to be here. Um, I think that it's also true that since my um, visit here last year, a lot has happened in health information exchange, uh, both the noun and the verb. Um, not all of that good, <laughs> but a lot of it really is good, and I think that the pieces are starting to uh, come together quite nicely. Now, um, per Mark Frissy's uh, advice that you know we should do something simple and do it really well, um, I I'm here to tell you that Direct Trust um, is an organization that's trying to do something uh, fairly simple and to do it really well. And, and that is to establish and maintain a security and trust framework to support directed exchange and to support uh, the implementers of direct exchange throughout the country um, in a way that can establish a single national trust community for direct um, and, and thereby uh, make direct uh, easier, less expensive, and less complicated for um, all sorts of different organizations to adopt and to use for their constituencies as subscribers and users. And uh, as Rim mentioned, we are the recipient of a cooperative agreement award from ONC um, as of the end of March last. Um, we really have two deliverables under that cooperative agreement um, to, to ONC. One is to expand our accreditation program for HISPs and CAs and RAs. Um, and also to build out and run at a fairly robust level um, a single national trust anchor bundle distribution service uh, that builds on uh, the accreditation program and makes it um, easy and uh, efficient for accredited organizations to know who the other accreditation or organizations are. And by the end of my talk, I hope um, I will have explained to you why that all kind of fits together. So I think we all know what the problem is that we're trying to solve here. Um, this is a study that was recently done by our friends at SureScripts of a county in near Phoenix in which there were 6,400 physicians using 70 different electronic health records. And although there was one uh, dominant electronic health record company uh, represented there, uh, Epic, it was still only 8% of the providers were using that uh, product. And in addition to all of those electronic health records, which can't now communicate with one another, whose users can't easily send information to one another, there are eight HIEs in that space, and they can't easily uh, send information uh, to one another. Um, and not to mention the pharmacies, and the home health agencies and all of other the providers who make up that community. And this fragmentation, which we also refer to as lack of interoperability sometimes, um, does have consequences, negative consequences for quality and for safety, and it certainly uh, creates uh, a cost burden. So I want you to imagine if all of those providers and all of those participants in healthcare in this community here could use email to communicate with one another when they needed to, transitions of care, for example, when a patient leaves the hospital. There would immediately be the ability for all of those folks, regardless of what IT system they're using, to communicate with one another. And that's really what direct is supposed to be able to do. Of course, you can't use email in the clear because those messages contain personal health information, and that has to be very secure, very protected, and it has to 
include the provision that you know who you're sending to and they know where the information is coming from. So there has to be some level of identity verification, identity validation um, in the system. But the whole point of direct is that it ought to be as simple to the users as email is to us. Many of you are engaging in email right now. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that's fine. <laughs> Say hello to whoever you're corresponding with. But um, you know, we, we almost can't stop doing it. And uh, of course, we use other things now besides email, but Twitter. But um, I want you to focus in on email. Now, most of us are used to working uh, and talking about um, direct and direct exchange within the context of stage two meaningful use. But actually, there's many, many other use cases for direct exchange besides uh, the um, provider transitions of care and uh, view, download, transmit portions of, of stage two meaningful use. So for example, if we think about this as a technology, a simple technology, a familiar technology to replace fax, e-fax, and mail, um, this is going to be great. Providers will be able to do it uh, during transitions of care. Um, very importantly, providers will be able to easily uh, send mail and attachments to their patients. And we hope very soon patients to do the reverse and have bidirectional communication with their providers. But then there are the federal and state agencies who, are, who, who, who don't have a lot of clinical information exchange with providers, but they have a lot of document exchange with providers. And they spend many millions, in, actually billions of dollars a year on fax and mail for whom direct, if we can make it secure enough to meet the federal agency's requirements, could replace. State agencies similarly, even the state exchanges, the in insurance exchanges, will I predict um, come to see the value of uh, direct. Payers are starting to get interested in the use of direct so that they can communicate with providers, provider organizations, um, and with some of their beneficiaries via direct instead of by fax and by mail. Um, and then uh, I think the patient horizon, not just provider to patient, but then patient to application with the information that they've garnered from their various providers um, is going to be a whole new area of very vibrant innovation in the future um, in what I would call a new generation of, of personal health records. A little background on direct trust. Um, direct trust is a, an outgrowth of the direct project. Um, most of the core members in, in direct trust were members of the direct project who then took upon themselves the job of developing the security and trust framework to support the public key infrastructure, which is the methodology uh, that is used to encrypt and identity validate uh, direct messages and attachments. Uh, the first <clears throat> part of the tr security and trust framework that was built out by the folks when it was still the direct rules of the road work group, direct project rules of the work group, work group was the certificate policy uh, for the X.09 uh, digital certificates. And as you can see from this slide, we were incorporated. Um, the organization um, has started an accreditation program for HISPs. Sorry. Thank you so much. Technology. Um, and um, then we got the ONC cooperative agreement, and then just more recently in May started the Trust Anchor Bundle distribution program. Direct Trust members now are about 85 organizations. They include a number of state HIEs. I think there are 17 or 18 state HIEs. There are coalitions at HIEs. Uh, Nate is a member of Direct Trust. Uh, HISPs, EHR vendors, provider groups, and so on. Uh, this is a national group. Um, they are either providing a direct addresses and direct exchange in all 50 states or are planning to do so um, in the coming months. And right now, Direct Trust is the only national entity doing accreditation for these um, HISPs, CAs, and RAs. Um, and the sole accrediting body uh, endorsed by ONC. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about 
uh, direct itself. I want to do a little le level setting with you. Um, I've observed um, over and over again in talking to parties who are going to be doing direct exchange that sometimes they don't really understand it very well. So I'm going to try to go very quickly through kind of some of the basic highlight ideas here that I think are important for you to understand to come away with a better idea of what direct exchange is all about and how it works and very importantly what it is not. Um, it's probably as important as what it is. So in, in this picture <clears throat> we have a HISP, a health internet service provider, that is operating with only its subscribers. So the senders and receivers on the left side of this uh, picture are subscribers to HISP A. But at this point, HISP A is really a private network. It's what many of us would think about as a secure email program provider. Um, all of those folks who are subscribers to that uh, HISP can communicate with each other. But at this point, they can't communicate with anybody else who's a subscriber of another HISP. So this really is like a hub. Um, and at this point, Exchange is limited to the subscribers of, of, of this HISP. And when you saw those 17 million transactions that ONC says were uh, direct exchanges uh, in 2012, 99.999% of those were exchanges of this type between entities, subscribers, organizations of a particular HISP. Because at that point, there was very little HISP to HISP uh, uh, exchange occurring. And in some ways, this really isn't even direct yet, because the specifications and protocols for direct involve moving data across the internet using one HISP set of uh, protocols and procedures with another. So in the next slide, I'm going to demonstrate to you what, um, oh, and one other very important point, I don't want to miss this. What I call the arc of liability is fairly clearly defined in this situation. It really, it, it covers only that HISP and the HISP subscribers and not any other parties uh, to the exchange. But now let's add in <coughs> a second HISP. Um, and in this case, we're going to call that the receiving HISP and the HISP on the left, the sending HISP. And notice the, now the box within the HISP has an additional uh, capability known as security and trust agent. And that's going to be an important part of this slide. So we have a sender on the left. And uh, in this case, let's give that some addresses. I have a number of direct addresses. One of them is uh, dkbmd at direct.kbmd. And suppose I'm trying to send a direct message to a cardiologist, because I'm a primary care physician, and I'm referring this person uh, to, to her. And her direct address is drsusan at direct.cardiology.com. And let's suggest that both of us have HISPs. My HISP happens to be a company called MaxMD, and her HISP happens to be um, a HISP in Oregon called Caracord, both of whom are direct trust members. Uh, Caracord is uh, uh, in, in Oregon and um, is become, both of these organizations are becoming accredited. And then let's uh, add in the next piece here, which is what the sending and receiving edge client or endpoint client looks like. On the sending side, MaxMD is able to help me configure my Mac mail so that I can send uh, an encrypted message to the HISP um, using the application that I use every day for my, uh, for my uh, email. And I notice a number of you are using it um, today, right now, to do email as well. Um, and um, on her side, she's using a web portal. <coughs> because the primary way which, in which Caracord interacts with its subscribers is via a web portal that you sign into an ID and password. And then finally, let's add in this component of uh, security and trust. And this involves the use of digital certificates that are exchanged between HISP A and HISP B 
in order for the encryption to occur and the identity validation to occur, because after all, this is happening over the internet. So that when the message goes from HISP A to HISP B, um, it is mediated by the use of those digital certificates and the public uh, private keys that I'm not going to go into now. Everybody's with me. Here's a really important point. The arc of liability here is really distinctly different because there's no formal relationship between HISP A and HISP B necessarily. Um, but clearly, they share some liability and share some risk, and the providers or the persons who are using those HISPs to engage in direct exchange are also sharing in that liability. And that's a very different story. And I think uh, it's this arc of liability and the risk management um, and the um, need to have this be private and secure um, that direct trust is all involved in. So in, let me do a digression here real quick and, 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 and try to answer the question what a HISP is and what a HISP is not. So in the definition that we're working on within direct trust, you have to have a HISP in order for there to be direct exchange. Somebody has to play that role for the subscriber. And if there's a, a cross HISP or inter HISP exchange, somebody has to be playing that role for the other uh, person involved. The HISP is the entity that conducts the secure transmission of direct messages to and from direct addresses, each of which is bound to a direct X.509 digital certificate. <laughs> In other words, it's the entity that's providing the direct services. Sometimes those are called direct STA services. A HISP must act in the capacity of a business associate or contractor for the customer. And in that relationship, uh, and one of the important aspects that makes direct work, the HISP handles the private key uh, for the subscriber or addressee. And that makes it a lot easier for uh, the provider not to have to worry about the um, uh, security component here. A HISP may be part of a larger organization. So in some cases, HISPs are just HISPs, <laughs> and that's all they do. But there's no reason that an HIE couldn't also be a HISP. Many of them are. Uh, a provider organization could be a HISP. Um, an EHR company could be a HISP. And of course, those organizations provide other services beyond the HISP to, to their customers. But here's the real key boundary, is that a HISP does not use, manage, or analyze, or otherwise perform actions upon the information transmitted and made secure. So one of the things that keeps this relatively simple with respect to the security and trust framework is, is that the security and tra trust framework for direct does not deal with any of the trust conditions associated with the use of the information. So for example, consent. There's nothing in the accreditation program of direct trust for HISP that says anything about consent says nothing about the use of the information. There's that boundary. If that organization is an HIE, of course they have to care about consent, but not with respect to direct. Just to round out this picture a little bit, let's put some other characters here uh, on the stage so you can understand um, who might else be uh, playing these roles. So for example, in this case, Epic, which has chosen not to be a HISP, um, is using for its customers in some of its implementations, some of its installations, SureScripts. And SureScripts is acting as a HISP. Um, and there will be occasions in which Epic customers, believe it or not, will actually be able to communicate with Cerner customers using Direct. <laughs> um, and in this case, uh, Cerner is acting as both the HISP, uh, the CA, and the RA. And in both of these cases, the Email, the direct email, is sent and received within the electronic health record as a tab or a module. The doctors don't have to leave, the nurses don't have to leave the application in order to engage in direct exchange. And then, let's take another example here. In this case, on the left-hand side, the um, edge system is ClinicSync. Now, ClinicSync is an Ohio HIE that operates a HISP that is actually operated by Medicity. So the Health Information Exchange has hired an outsourced 
they are HISP operations to medicine. And in this case, Clinisync doesn't have to be accredited as a HISP because Medicity is performing all of that functionality. That message that's coming from Dr. Rob at directfamilypractice.com through Clinisync and Medicity could go and will go to personal health records. And in this case, the personal health record that I've uh, chosen to use as an example is no more clipboards. So the distinct capability here that I'm illustrating is, is that regardless of who the sending HISP is, the receiving HISP could well be um, that operated for a patient. And in each of these cases, you know, who the edge client is and whether it's an electronic health record, or personal health record, so forth, makes very little difference. But what's absolutely critical here is, is that the arc of liability um, is met, that there is some way that these organizations and their subscribers are assured and can have confidence in the fact that the messages will be private, that the content of the messages will be secure, and that the identity of the party sending the information back and forth will be validated. Okay, so now we get to the interesting part. How does HISP A know that HISP B or HISP X or Y or Z or any other HISP out there that has um, subscribers with whom HISP A may wish to exchange direct messages, how does HISP B know that those other parties are trustworthy enough to exchange HISP subscribers' personal health information with? How do they know that? Where does that arrangement around the security controls, the agreement as to the level of identity verification that has occurred prior to uh, the certificates being issued, how does that happen? And what are the risks um, if uh, you exchange with a, a, a party that is not following the rules or um, is using a, a, a direct address that's not valid or is actually fake and impersonating something? Secondly, how does HISP A establish a baseline of assurance regarding security and trust and identity with all of these other HISPs? And how, does, how do we do it in such a way that that baseline scales, that everybody knows what it is and accepts it and therefore uh, can have a, a, a level playing field which allows them to exchange information easily and seamlessly um, with a lot, not a lot of hassle? And then finally, what mechanisms are available to HISPs to signal its trustworthiness. Because HISP A wants the other HISPs to know that it is trustworthy. They have passed some test to become uh, uh, known as a secure and trustworthy HISP um, so that the other parties can say, oh yeah, if a message comes from that HISP or one of its subscribers, we'll let it, we'll let it pass, we'll let it go through. We won't um, turn it away. So, this was the situation, you know, almost two years ago when the direct Rules of the Road work group members got together. And they said, look, one of the ways in which um, these relationships of security and trust can be established is by every HISP contracting with every other HISP. So HISP A says to HISP B, uh, we want you to abide by this security uh, practice within your data center. And HISP B says, no, we don't think that's really important. We, we don't want to do that, but we'll do something else. And then they go back and forth um, and ultimately uh, arrive at a legal contract. And at that point, they say, yeah, okay, we'll exchange, we'll exchange information with you now. We trust you. But the problem with that, <laughs> it's actually been alluded to earlier this morning, the problem with that is that then every HISP has to make a contract with every other HISP. And uh, that won't scale, that's very complicated, it's rate limiting. Um, some of the contracts that have been actually established in uh, the real world have cost tens of thousands of dollars and many months to effect. Um, really, when you think about it, what we want is a single network for direct. And we want a network effect that means that every new party to that network adds value to the network, and as the network grows, the participation of those parties on the network becomes more valuable to them. This is known as the N squared problem. Um, 
and uh, I, I'm not going to bore you with it because you saw it earlier this morning. Um, but the point is, is that by the time you get to something like 28 HISPs who are contracting each with the other, then you've got 278 contracts to manage. And furthermore, when you think about the real world, the, the likelihood that all of those contracts will be the same is very, very small. So you get the variability uh, that um, uh, you don't want to enter the system. So the approach that direct trust members have taken um, is to create what is, in effect, a test, an accreditation program, built on the security and trust framework components, the policies, the best practices, the guidances that are part of that security and trust framework I talked about earlier. And that accreditation program that we've started is done in partnership with an organization called ENAC. Many, many of you may know of ENAC, the Electronic Healthcare uh, Commission on Networking. And ENAC has a process in place. They've been doing accreditations for a long time. And we started our accreditation program with them uh, in February. Right now, there are five HISPs that are fully accredited. And there are another 11 that are in what are called candidate status. And we have another 25 or 26 organizations that have committed to becoming accredited by the end of 2013. So the hope is, is that we will have an accredited, we will have enough accredited HISPs by the end of 2013 to create a fairly robust national network of uh, for direct which will not depend upon additional contracting between any of those parties. Now, the real world being what it is, there may be groups in parts of the country that want to form their own uh, alliance, if you will, um, and their own trust community, if you will. And that's fine. We would just hope that direct trust would be part of that alliance's solution to the direct uh, uh, problem, and, and, and that you would, in effect, Bar, they will effect borrow from direct trust accreditation program um, and from the um, trust anchor bundle distribution system that we've set up. A word about the trust anchor bundle distribution. <clears throat> what is that and how does it work? Well, in some ways, that's sort of the payoff to being accredited. Because if you're accredited, then your tr what's called, known as a trust anchor, which is a signing certificate, can go into a bundle, and that bundle can then be distributed to the public, indicating that those entities that have issued those trust anchors are accredited and to be, um, uh, to be trusted. The technical definition of trust in all of this is that each HISP has the other's trust anchor in its trust store. Um, so it becomes very important for those uh, HISP that are accredited to have the easy accessibility of those other trust anchors and not have to get them one at a time from all of the accredited HISPs. This is a slide just I put in here just to show you that it's even a little more complicated than, than if I've convinced you you need to take a nap. Um, it's even <laughs> a little more complicated because uh, We've been talking about HISP, but HISPs rely on two other trusted entities, uh, a registration authority, or an RA, and a CA. The registration authority is the entity that performs the identity verification for the organization, or the individual, or both, who is an addressee of indirect. The certificate authority is the entity that relies upon the registration authority's information about the identity of that person or organization in order to issue and manage the X.509 digital certificates. And then it is the HISP that relies upon both the CA and the RA to use those certificates to do the exchange in a way that is encrypted and identity validated. If, if it works out, and it's starting to look like it, it may well work out, um, this is sort of the way it will work. Um, Direct Trust at the top has a trust anchor bundle distribution. Um, in this slide, there are only three HISPs. All of them are accredited by Direct Trust. There are uh, three different communities represented at the outer edge, provider EHR, provider HIE, provider PHRC. And 
because those organizations, HISPs, are accredited, they can seamlessly communicate with anyone on any one of those other communities without any further negotiations. Any other community that comes into this picture, into this network, that brings a HISP that's accredited would also be able then to extend this network to that new party, that new set of, of subscribers in that community. Four or five others join the same way. They would also be instantly part of that trust community, and it would be like, will be like, uh, a set of Christmas tree lights going off, where you plug into the network through the accreditation of the Trust Anchor Bundle distribution, um, the trust relationships are federated, and the exchanges go through smoothly uh, without interruptions. This is the situation we don't want to occur. <laughs> if we have multiple trust communities and multiple Trust Anchor Bundle distributions and multiple sets of rules whereby direct communities set up their uh, security and trust provisions, what will happen is, is it will have um, these notices um, that you get when you go to a website. I'm sure you've done this when you go to a website that is mediated by HTTPS and the certificate's not valid or it's been revoked and you get this message that says, you know, this may not be L.L. Beans. <laughs> you know, this may not be your bank. Um, do you really want to go any further? And um, of course, most of us just do anyways, but uh, we, sh we probably shouldn't because this is an indication that there's something wrong in that chain of trust. This situation is actually not all that different from what direct trust is doing, although direct trust is, is mediating a bi-directional email exchange and not an e-commerce exchange. But your browsers, and some of you are probably at Amazon right now as I'm speaking, um, when you go to Amazon and you click my account, you know, a trust anchor on your browser is activated by a web browser, the Amazon, excuse me, the website's uh, uh, end use certificate, and they have to match up before that green light goes on and it goes from HTTPS. And at that point, you've authenticated that it's Amazon um, and you've encrypted that uh, channel that, for that session. So, I, I hope uh, this has been useful. Uh, I, I look forward to talking with any of you about uh, any of the, the, the concepts or any of the, uh, the mechanisms that I've talked about. Uh, the directtrust.org website has a lot of information uh, that's, uh, I hope, uh, uh, pretty evident to you. Uh, we would love for you to be Direct Trust members. Um, it's a growing community. It's a very open community. <clears throat> we have four work groups uh, and soon to have a five, a fifth. Um, and participating in those work groups is the best way to actually learn about how to do a direct implementation uh, according to the, uh, the technique and the technology uh, and the standards that I've been talking about. So, thank you.